course, we have more people filter in as, as, as worship comes in. Uh, very quickly, if you remember, vote after church. Um, it, uh, if you vote yes, it's, it's okay to use the money for the roof at the, whatever, at the school. If you vote no, you say it's not okay. Um, you know, when we were listening, just, just, a, just a quick blurb on that. When I was listening to this worship song, the, uh, God really loves us. The, the, it's kind of interesting how, how things sometimes come to mind. Uh, that song, it's a Crowder song. It's like the most bittersweet song in my entire life. Uh, you may remember the, why, you know, because I've talked about it in the past. But I was, of course, everybody knows uh, my man's Toby Mac. I mean, that's, it's, I'm a T-Mac guy. But I was at a Toby Mac and a Crowder concert and when, when I got the call that my mom had passed. And that song, that Crowder song, God Really Loves Us, what was my sister, I looked down, I knew, I just knew. I looked down at my phone, I had seven missed calls from my sister, and that's, I, I just knew it was bad. And I went out in the, I went out in the hallway, and as she was telling me mom had passed, you, you know, I had that song in the background. You know, Crowder was singing that song, God Really Loves Us. The, the thing that was kind of crazy about it, and, and I've listened to it a thousand times, and I've never, never really kind of saw the mercy that was kind of going on, just the timing of me seeing, seeing the phone call because she'd been trying to get a hold of me for a while. Never really noticed the songs talking about God is with me in the fire and he's with me in the valley. There was some other, some, some other thing in that verse. But, but, but when, when I was receiving this news a year and a half ago in the background, I had Crowder singing about God being with me in the hard times. The fact that that even though this was now both of my parents that were gone, the, the uh, I had a father who loved me, and, and that he was there. You know, so it's just it's just really kind of crazy how you know it's been like a year and a half. I've heard the song a hundred times since then. I've played it here two or three times, and, and it, it it never clicked. Kind of the mercy God was showing me in the timing of of when I saw this these text messages. You know, for my, for me to a call my sister, but God, it's crazy how God does things. I'm, I mean, He is an amazing God. He He just is. I'm sorry. He just. I don't apologize for that. God is an amazing God. The, the, his timing is perfect. And I know His timing and my timing never line up. They just don't. I'm a very impatient guy. I want things yesterday. He, you know, I get an idea in my head. I want it to happen tomorrow. You know, God doesn't work that way, but God's timing is always, 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 always perfect. It just is. And I do have to do one little, before we dive into the message, one quick disclosure. Everybody here knows this, but in case you're joining uh, online for the first time ever, even though my shirt it, it's a, you know, it says, uh, do not resist, you know, I'm not cracking on law enforcement. <laughs> You know, I don't want to get some message. You know, what are you being disrespectful to the police? I am the police. You, you know, it, it's a funny shirt. I it just, I, I, I got a kick out of it. Some people take that stuff very personal. Sometimes when you, sometimes when people think that you're cracking on law enforcement, they get upset. I am not. This, this is, it's just a cute shirt. I'm sorry. But I know even the officers. Some, my, my family, my family get together sometimes are really, really interesting. I had a, I had a cousin who was an officer. Uh, for many, many years, retired from a, an agency in West Virginia. Some people are really high-strung, and some people are really not high-strung. You, you know, I'm, I'm the really not high-strung version. You, you know, you tell me a good cop joke, I think it's funny. I, I, I mean, it's just, I've, I've got a shirt that has little stick police officers with big bellies, eating donuts, and, you know, where your ticket money goes. You know, I just think that stuff's funny. You know, I do. I just, I just do. But my... Uh, I have a, I have a, my brother-in-law, I, I adore my brother-in-law. I mean, he, he, he's one of these people, he doesn't hide anything about who he is or what he thinks, and, and, and he, he just has kind of an off-color humor in, in, in a way, and, and he, just, he just shoots from the hip, and he, he made a donut joke to my, to my family member, uh, it was my cousin who's an officer, and, and there was almost a fist fight in a family reunion because my, my cousin was just like, you can't make jokes like that. Only we can make jokes like that. And I'm like, you know, come on now. He, he, you know, fam, our family get-togethers sometimes get to be very interesting. They, they really, really do. 
So I am not, I am not being mean. I'm not cracking on law enforcement. It's just a funny shirt. Do not resist. Got it on Tamu for like seven bucks. I mean, you can't beat that. All righty. Blessed. We're going to do two weeks of blessed. What am I talking Blessed. We're going to be looking at the very first part of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, what is the Sermon on the Mount? There are two sermons or two lessons that Jesus gives that's referenced in the, in the Bible. This is the one many refer to, including myself, as the greatest sermon of all times. You know, why is that? The, the, we know that Jesus came to clarify the law. He came to give us a proper perspective on the law. He came to fix everything that, that we were misunderstanding about the law. So the Sermon on the Mount, if you haven't noticed, you know, some of the, 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 kind of the sermons I've been doing in the last couple of weeks, talking about the law and, and different things, is that, is that Jesus was constantly connecting and, and, and referencing the law. So the whole Sermon on the Mount, if, if you really kind of break it down and look at it, the whole thing is Jesus properly interpreting the law, the entire thing. It's Jesus looking at looking at the law, and it's just like you know you've heard it said this, but that you know, you know it, it was he, he gives it lots and lots of clarification. Everything that people were arguing about it seemed like Jesus hammered it on the Sermon on the Mount. The the other the, the teaching, and because I ask people, I say, you know, it's back to the future time. Say the professor shows up in the DeLorean and says, "Where do you want to go? Anywhere in time, anywhere in, in the history of the world? Where do you want to go?" And I and I've asked people, you know, what would be what would be the one teaching that you would want to sit on, you know, hearing Jesus, you know, teach. And this is what ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people say. I'd love to have been there. I'd like the professor to put me in the DeLorean, and take me back to the Sermon on the Mount. That's actually not mine. Do you, do you, you know the remember the story of the road of the Emmaus? You know, in the road to Emmaus, the, uh, these, these, these two followers were talking about, you know, everything that had just happened, the crucifixion, and Jesus kind of like, poof, out of nowhere, and he's like walking along with them, and, and, the, uh, and, and he's talking with them, and it says, it, it references this teaching that he gave these two people, that he basically goes through the entire law and the prophets and shows how he was in the entire thing. That is what I would want to hear. I would want, if, if the professor kind of came and said, where do you want to go? I'm going to go to the road to Emmaus, and I want to be the third guy that, that, that Jesus tells us to, and I'm hoping that I can take my iPad so I can record the entire thing, because that would be a teaching that I would want to hear. Of course, you know that that's, that's, that's something I get excited about, but blessed. We're going to be spending this week and next week on, on the Beatitudes, you know, what are the Beatitudes? You know, that's some. That's one of those things. The per, the pericope. Remember, I talked about the pericope is those smaller pieces inside chapters because we break things up, uh, you know, in, in the in the books and chapters and stuff. And that's not kind of the way it was written. But in this section of Matthew five, we like to title it the Beatitudes. You know, in just about every version of the Bible I've read, it's always the Beatitudes. These are things that things that you should try to be like. These should be your B attitudes. You, you know, because. It's kind of self-explanatory. But packed in the Beatitudes, Jesus, Jesus mentions, I think, about uh, 10 to 12 things. I haven't counted it, but it's 10 to 12 things where if you were one thing, uh, you are blessed. You know, so, he, he's, so what is he doing here? He's extracting things from the law, and he's, he's driving home their importance, and he's even saying that when you do this, or you are this way, or you do this thing, you are blessed. So, so why is this important? Again, I've said this many, many times, especially over the last few weeks. When Jesus interprets the law, you want to listen. Why? Because he's the writer of the law. You know, who knows better what the law means and what it was intended for than, than the very God who gave it to us? You know, so you, whenever Jesus interprets the law, or if any time Jesus points out something as being important, or he drives a point home, listen to what it is, don't blow it off. If it's in red, if you've got a red letter Bible, and, and you open up and it's in red, listen to what Jesus is saying. Because you're never going to get a more appropriate or proper interpretation or response about anything that has to do with God or the law. 
So these Beatitudes, Jesus is pointing out things that if you do this, and every single one of these are tucked away in the, in the Old Testament and what we would consider the law, the law and the prophets. He's saying when you do these things, you are blessed. So let's start off with the very first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you're in my Sunday school class, you, you get to cheat a little bit, because we, we talked about this for a couple of weeks. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Does that mean that you're you, you know, just not strong in the spirit? Does it mean that you're just not, uh, just not cool in the spirit? You know, what, what does that mean? To be poor in spirit is simply the recognition that you need God. That you and yourself are not sufficient enough. That you need God. So what Jesus is saying is, is you're blessed when you get that you need me. You are blessed when you realize that you and yourself are not enough. Because the reality is, it's true. Jesus, here's some more of this red letter stuff. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, listen to this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me. That is how, that is why we are blessed when we realize our need for God. Because without him, we really can't do anything. You know, we can muddle through life, we can, we can get a cool job, we can buy cool stuff, we can do this, this and that and the everything, but when it comes to things of eternal significance or things that bring us peace or things that, 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 that put us on the, on the straight, narrow path, things that, 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 that are righteous, when we do those things, we can only do those with the assistance of our Lord and Savior. You can't do it on your own. Have you ever tried to be just good on your own? And I know I've, taught, I've mentioned this in the past, and it was, it, it's not really meant to be funny, I guess, in the way it can be. I was dumb enough many, many years ago for my New Year's resolution, I was going to go a year without sinning. I kid you not, that, that, was, that, was, gonna be, that was my goal. My New Year's resolution, and that's why I say New Year's resolutions are just kind of, they're just kind of a joke anyway, because nobody, nobody actually sticks to them. But that was, I was, I was one year. One year, I'm not going to sin for a year. You know what? I'm not sure I got through January 1st. Why? Because in myself, in myself, I can't do it. I, I just can't do it. But, and, and this is what made it even worse. I didn't say, for the next year, in the name of Jesus, I'm not going to sin. That's not what I said. I said, I'm going to go a year without sinning, which means for my own willpower and my own strength and my own everything, I was going to pull this off. I was going to go for a whole year and just not drop the ball. Well, let me tell you, what, it ain't going to happen. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. If you, if you need peace or you're trying to overcome an issue with sin, without him, you ain't going to do it. You can't do it. Why? Because the heart what is it? it's deceiving, it's wicked, it's all these things the Bible tells us it is. Even though the, when we come to know the Lord, we get a new nature, do you still not struggle with the old one? You absolutely do. You're always fighting the old man. So as long as, as, as long as we are on this side of heaven, and we still live in this fleshly body, and we still deal with a, 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 a sinful world, we're not going to do it on our own. You just, it's just not going to happen. And the cool thing is that even when you go to heaven, you're still not going to be in a sin-free environment because of something that you've done. You're going to be living in heaven in a sin-free environment because Jesus squished it. He still did it all. You still, even in heaven, don't get to enjoy a sin-free environment if it were not for the grace of our Lord. That's part of what makes heaven heaven. Can you just picture that for a second? Heaven. We see these really cool pictures. But what it might be, especially when you look in Revelation, you talk about a glassy sea and thunder and lightning coming out of the throne. Of, and, and, and everybody's saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you see all these, these cool little snippets. But could you just imagine a place, a place where sin doesn't exist? 
And what does Jesus tell us in Revelation? A, a place where he wipes away every single one of our tears. You know, that, that, that's just amazing. That's not the lesson. But any time you talk about heaven, you just, you just, you just got to stay quick, just for a second, just kind of absorb what that means. But even heaven is not possible if not for the, for the graciousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you are blessed when you get that you need him. You are blessed when you get that, that you can't make it without him. Why? Because one of the most frustrating things in life is trying to do something and falling flat on my face. And I will fall flat on my face every single time when I try to do it without him. The next one. This is where, we, this is where we're at in the Sunday school. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Believer, listen. Believer, listen. If you've accepted Christ in your heart and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to what I'm about to say. It doesn't matter what you are mourning, whether it's the mourning the loss of a family member, you're mourning the loss of a job, you're mourning the loss of a relationship. It doesn't matter what you are mourning. If your heart is heavy, and you are lamenting over something, Jesus doesn't say, I may comfort you. There's, there's nothing like that in there. He doesn't say, you know, if you mourn, things are probably going to be all right. That's not what he says. Jesus himself, Sermon on the Mount, the clarification of, of, of all the important stuff here in the law, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How fast does that comfort come? can't answer that. Because here's the funny thing, and this, this comes back to that timing thing that I was talking about. God's timing is not always my timing. God promises that you will be comforted. You, you know, is that today? Is that tomorrow? Is that next year? I don't know. But what he has also told us is he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. So there should be a, there should be a little silver lining of, of, of comfort and that in itself, that even when you mourn, you are not alone. I remember my, one of my very favorite passages in, in Psalms, and it's only worded this way in the King James Version and the New Living Translation. But, but it, says that, it, it says that God stores all of our tears in a bottle. You know, is this reality or is this poetic language? I, I don't know. It's, I'm, I'm leaning kind of towards poetic language, but it still drives home such an important point that you have never shed a single tear in your entire life that God didn't see, that he didn't pay attention to, and that he didn't record in his book. That's straight from the Psalms. That's not me. So even when you're mourning, and sometimes when we mourn, we, we have a tendency of not wanting, not being able to feel the presence of God. Because have you ever had, you know, opposing things screaming at you at the same time? You know, have you ever had, you know, something that's yelling, you know, you've just lost, you just lost, you just lost, you just lost, you just lost something important. But then you had a little still small voice saying, it's okay, I'm still here. You know, so sometimes we don't feel the comfort of, of Christ in our times of mourning. But that, that, let me, I can assure you that it's there from the very moment that you, that you suffer the loss. It, it just is. So my prayer for you, if you're in that place, whether you're in this church or you're on YouTube, I encourage you that if you're dealing with a loss of whatever it is and, and you, just, you just don't feel the presence of God, I just, I just encourage you to pray, Holy Spirit, let me hear the voice of my Savior. Will it be a, an audible, you know, hey, I'm here. Hey, Greg, I'm here. You know, that's not, that's not the, usually the way that works. It, it's usually just a, it's just a little peace, this little comfort. It's the voice of God saying, you're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. Because he promises that if you mourn, you will be comforted. Remember me talking about the mission of Christ? What was Christ's mission? He laid it out. 
And one of the really cool stories in the New Testament, he opens the book of Isaiah, or the scroll, he opens the scroll of Isaiah, lays that thing out, and he makes a, he reads from it, and, he's, and then he rolls it back up, and he says, today this has been fulfilled. So what, what was he saying? He's like, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the guy that, that Isaiah was talking about. And almost, you want to talk about upsetting the apple cart. Basically, he had just announced in a synagogue to a bunch of Jewish people, I'm the Messiah. You want to talk about, whoo, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't imagine, I can't imagine what it would have looked like and erupted inside the synagogue at the time. But this is the passage that he was, that he was referring to. And I think I made it too big that I can't see the passages. It's Isaiah 61. I can't remember the exact, the exact uh, scripture passages. But this is out of Isaiah 61. It says this. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Hear that? Bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives, the release of darkness of the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Here we go. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. You know what, I, I come from, I, my, uh, my kind of upbringing in, in ministry and church was from the, kind of, from the kind of a church that talks about Holy Ghost goosebumps. That's what it's talking about. When I read that, it's just, just like, can't just, just catch for a second what this is saying. Catch, catch for a second. What this, is, this is, Jesus quotes this, this very passage. This very passage, to comfort all who mourn. You know, Jesus came to comfort you when you mourn. It's one of the reasons he came, to give you comfort in your time of mourning. To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Jesus came to exchange your ashes your brokenness, your burnt-down world, your burnt-down situation, your burnt-down family, your burnt-down relationship, your burnt-down anything that you have. He came to exchange those ashes for a crown of beauty. There it is again. I get, just, I get goosebumps just thinking about what the Scripture is saying here. When Jesus said that I will never leave you nor forsake you, not even to the end of the age. He meant it. And one of the reasons he is here, even to this very moment, one of the very reasons he sits at the right hand of the Father and advocates for you is for your peace and your comfort in times of mourning. Let me tell you something about the Father-Son relationship here. When Jesus asks the Father for something like comfort for your grieving, guess what? The Father gives it. <laughs> he just does. You know, it's really, it's really nice. It's really nice having, having a friend on the inside, having a, a Savior on the inside. My Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. Mind you, he earned that spot. Mind you, even before he came, he was already part of the Godhead. You know, he was already deserving even before he, even before he came in the flesh and did everything. He was already deserving of that spot, but he especially is deserving of it in my heart after what he did for me and the sacrifice and raising from the dead and saving me from myself. But think about that for a second. The Bible tells us we have, there is one mediator between us and the Father, and it's Jesus. It's the same Jesus who died to save you. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Why is he sitting? Because his work is done. But he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's telling the Father, my brother or sister here, they're hurting. 
They need comfort. And the father always listens to the son. He just does. He just does. So if you're hurting, hang in there. If you're mourning, hang in there. You know, the darkness only lasts for the night. But the joy comes in the morning. It may feel like you've been in the night for a long time. But I promise you, the, the morning is coming. And even while you still walk in the places of darkness, he is still with you. He promises. Jesus promises us comfort when we mourn. And let me tell you what, Jesus has never broken a promise. That's what makes him Jesus. He's never broken a promise. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What's it mean to be meek? I think in, in our culture, the American culture, meekness, kind of what we picture in meekness, is we, we picture some, some guy or gal, you know, with some, some thick glasses, with a pocket protector, sitting at the table and just letting the world pass him or her by. I think that's the message. That's the message that, that our culture teaches us about meekness. I believe our culture tells us that meekness is weakness. Have you ever gotten that idea from, 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 from the culture you live in, that meekness equals weakness? Oh, I know you have. I know you have. Especially, I think this might even be true, and I, I might be wrong, but I think this might even be true just a teeny tiny piece more even for the guys in our society because we were taught that weakness is a bad thing. That meekness is a bad thing because we're less of a man if we're meek. Let me tell you what meekness is. Here's the Greg Voorhees definition of meekness. I've never looked it up in the dictionary, but if, 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 you, if you do, it probably says something kind of like this. Meekness is strength under control. Just because you can be strong, you can be a strong person, and sometimes it takes strength not to react. Let me tell you what, reacting is easy. Kind of the was this the, the reaction versus response thing? Reacting to something is very easy. Why? Because we deal with the simple nature. Somebody wrongs us, we just want to wrong them back. Something happens to us, we want to lash back out. Or because we have power or authority over something or someone that we want to exercise it just because we can. That's not meekness. Meekness is having strength. Meekness is having power. Meekness is having authority and using it with restraint for the embitterment of everyone around you. Let's do, here's some more of this red letter stuff. This is Jesus talking. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I am gentle and humble in heart. Do you see the meekness connection here? Has any foot ever stepped on this planet who had more authority and power than Jesus Christ himself. Let's go back to John 1, the first, the, the, the first 
The very first chapter of John, I know I quote this a lot, but it's so important to always catch. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what, what does that mean? And he created everything that was ever created. So what, who, what, who is the Word that John's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. So what does John tell us about Jesus? He created everything that there ever was to be created. Anything that was ever created, it was created at the hand of Christ. We see that the Apostle John tells us that in John 1. So, so let's wrap our head around this for a second. So when Jesus was in, in his con, incarnate body here before the crucifixion, he walked, he walked the earth, and he was still the same Jesus who created the earth. He was the same Jesus who created mankind. He was the same Jesus that created everything that ever was. So if anybody had, nobody has ever walked this earth with, with, with more power and authority than Jesus Christ himself. But what does he say about himself? Learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. He has and had absolute authority. He had absolute power. He had absolute everything. But did he exercise it? Did he squish things just because he was offended? Did, he, what, did he, you ever see Jesus squish anybody? Did you ever see Jesus just, when somebody spit on him, just haul off and whoosh, whack hand on him? Did you ever see it? Want to know why? Because it didn't happen. Jesus is the picture of meekness. No one has been stronger. No one has had more authority. No one has had more power. And what did he do? He let us kill him. That is power, strength, and authority under restraint. He let us kill him. But thank God that was not the end of the story. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Kind of the orig in the original language, it's this, it's this, this cool depiction. He's actually saying that lowly, it's actually lowly of heart, where, where he's, it's, it's described as almost like a plant that doesn't stand up nice and tall, but it kind of just lays low to the ground. So the, the, the one person had the most ability, most power, most authority, showed perfect restraint. So let me tell you what, should we not strive to do the same thing? It's okay to get angry. Do you ever see God get angry? You see God get angry. Remember Jesus, when he goes, when he goes into Jerusalem and he sees the, the, the people turn into the house of prayer, we, we talked about this scripture a few weeks ago, he turned into the house of prayer and into, into, a, into a marketplace, and so they fashioned the whip, you know, it was put that thing together, and foot tables, and did, he, did it say that he hit anyone with it? No, but he was destroying, he was pushing out the abomination that was in the house of prayer. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry. But be very careful in your anger that you remain meek. Just a couple more here. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, here's another, here's another thing that Jesus said that didn't have a maybe attached to it or didn't have a condition attached to it. He says if you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, what's he say? You're going to be filled. What does that mean? 100% of the time, 100% of the time, if you seek the righteousness of Christ, he will always meet you and he will give it to you. How do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? You know, that's, it's one thing to say hunger and thirst for it. What does that look like, you may ask? What does it look like to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Have you ever just wanted to dig into your Bible? Because you wanted to find something really, really cool there? Have you ever just said, God, God, show me something in your word that just gets me excited? Would that be a hunger or thirst for righteousness? Or have you ever gone to the Lord in prayer and just like, Lord, I just want to talk to you. 
I got stuff I want to bring to you. I want to talk about things with you. I want to do the right thing, God. Help me do the right thing. I want to just just do the right thing. I want to be a, a good ambassador for you. I want to be somebody that when they see me, they see you. I don't want them to see me. What about John the Baptist? Lord, I need to decrease, so you must increase. That is hunger and thirst for righteousness. So when you decide all of a sudden it's not about you, and it's about him, and you do anything that you need to do, whether that be prayer, meditation, reading the Bible, whatever it is, just anything you can, just to, just to know him more, to get excited about him more, to be into him more, to learn more about him. He says, when you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. Let me tell you what, something about the Bible. I've studied it a lot. I've read the whole thing. I've read... I've got a library of books that I read when I was in school. So I've read a lot about the Bible. I I, I know probably a little bit more than the average person on the street. But let me tell you what. It doesn't matter how many times I read a passage or how many books I read about the Bible. I always find something new in there I never saw before. That's the really cool thing about God. There are so many layers to God and so many layers in his word. And let me tell you what, you're not going to start peeling away those layers and getting to know the deepness of his word or the deepness of who he is unless you hunger and thirst for it and you go after it. I'll tell you what, for us, salvation is easy. Jesus paid the price for salvation, but even just accomplishing salvation, you know, believing in my heart, professing with my mouth and believing in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was dead, buried, raised, and sits at the right hand of the Father. It's easy for me to believe that because of the evidence that I have seen. I don't have blind faith in Jesus. The evidence is there, but it's easy to be saved. He paid the price. He did all the work. All I got to do is recognize that it was a real thing and that he is exactly who he says he is. That's what the Bible says it takes to be saved. Salvation is easy. But does that mean that when when you become saved, that you're instantly blessed with this deep knowledge of the things of God? Absolutely not. You want to know who the most dangerous Christian is in the world? (laughs) This This might be taken wrong, but let's hear me out. Hear the whole thing before you place judgment on me. Probably the most dangerous Christian in the world is the new Christian. Why is that? Because they have the zeal of God, but they don't know much about the ways of God. Let me tell you what, that's something that doesn't get fixed overnight. I had that mentality and jacked up a lot of things for many years. I still mess things up over 30 years later. But I can also say, let me preface it this with, actually, I can't preface it, I've already said it. But let me say this, though. Nothing gets me more excited than the faith of a new believer. Because I'll tell you what, when you've been around for a while, sometimes the, the, the excitement of the things of God have a way of waning in your heart. But when you see the fire in a new believer, let me tell you what, that kindles a, a little flame in myself. You know, so I don't want, I don't want, so if you're a new believer out there, oh, he's, he's bad. No, I'm not. I'm excited about your faith. But the deep knowledge of the ways of God, the things that he says, the things he wants us to do, that doesn't come overnight. You have to be hungry for it. You have to look for it. You have to dig into that word. You need to come to him in prayer. That's the only way that you're going to, to find, have the, the deep secrets of the Lord revealed. Why is the prayer so important to that? Why is prayer so important to the process of, 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 of hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Because even in the Word, you don't know anything about God that He has not let you know. You don't know anything about God that He hasn't revealed about Himself. And that's the cool thing about the living, breathing Word of God. Sometimes it takes me reading something 15 times before He reveals something new that was always there, but I had this light bulb moment like, how did I miss that the last 20 years? But you need to hunger 
and thirst for righteousness. Proverbs 21, 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. So the writer of Proverbs is saying it's a good thing to seek after that righteousness. And Jesus is saying if you seek after it, you're going to find it. That's the, that's the, that's the one-two punch. It's good to look for it. You're going to get it. That's the old one-two punch. Proverbs 21, 21. We'll look at one more. Blessed or blessed, however you want to say it, potato, potato. <laughs> blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Don't let this escape you. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Actually, I want to read, I'm going to tell a story, and we're going to look at this passage of James, and we're just going to talk about it. This is the last slide, by the way, but we're just going to talk about this for a second. James 2, 12 through 13. Who's James? The half-brother of Jesus. So what does that tell me? That tells me that it doesn't have the same weight as Jesus, obviously. Jesus is 100% authority. But if you're the half-brother of Jesus and you grew up with this guy, let me tell you what, you probably picked up a thing or two in, in, in your lifetime. You, you, you know, you, so anything James says, I'm not trying to give you know, more credibility over one right or over another, but when the half-brother of Jesus, the guy that grew up with Jesus, you, you, you know, says, that's another guy I like to listen to. He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment, listen to this, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What is James saying? Jesus says, blessed are the merciful because you will be shown mercy. James is kind of looking at it from the opposite end of things. James is saying, you know what? If you're not shown mercy, if you don't show mercy, guess what? You're not going to get mercy. Does Jesus address this in another story? I love Jesus' parables. They're just... <laughs> Jesus tells a story about an unmerciful servant. I've talked about this a number of times because this is, this, is one of those, this is one of those stories that there's just so much stuff packed into it. So this guy, this servant, owed the king a debt he could never repay in his entire life, even if he lived like 20 lifetimes. I don't remember the exact amount. It, it tells us what the exact amount is, and, and, and it's just a parable. So it's, it tells us the exact amount, but it, and, and, and then we can translate that into English. Language. It's, it's like millions or billions of dollars. It was a lot of money. And this is how much he owes the king. The king calls him in, and I can only picture him. <gasps> the king's calling me to account for my debt. What does the king do in the story? Again, this is a parable. This isn't, this isn't a story of something that happened. This is a parable. It's a story that explains a point. The king says, guess what? Your entire debt's forgiven. <coughs> okay, before we continue on, let's, let's think about what is the parallel? It's a parable. What's the parallel? You as a believer, you came to the Father and said, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. I can't make it without you. And what did the Father say? You're forgiven. Your debt's been discharged. I have taken all of your sin debt from the time you were born to the time you died, and I've laid it on the shoulders of my son, and guess what? Poof, it's gone. You have been justified. That's that. That's that legal term. I now find you not guilty. So, I know it's a parable, but we got to keep this in perspective. You have, believers, you have appeared before a king, and your debt has been canceled. 
Let's continue the story. So now the servant, who was just forgiven the huge that he could never repay, runs into another servant that owes him a little bit of money. Just a little bit of money. And again, the amounts are there. I just know it wasn't a lot. It's like a paycheck kind of deal. And what does the servant do that was just forgiven the entire debt? He grabs him by the neck and he's just like, you owe me money. You owe me money. If you don't pay me my money, I'm going to throw you in jail. <sighs> so then what, 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 what happens then? The king, the word gets back to the king what had happened. And he calls the guy back in. I imagine he's just a little bit more cocky this time because now he's coming to the king without a debt. He says, oh, you wicked, wicked boy. You were forgiven such a great debt. And you couldn't even forgive a little debt. And guess what? He was cast out. This is just a story. This is just a story to drive home a point of the importance of mercy. You have been shown amazing, incredible, unrelenting, unending mercy by the God of the universe. And again, this is me preaching to myself. I, I'll tell you, I preach to myself more than I preach to you. You've been forgiven a debt you could never pay. Are you holding a debt against someone, a much smaller debt, and you refuse to show mercy? It's a place I wouldn't want to be. It's a place I don't want to be. If there is no mercy in your heart, If there's no mercy in your heart, it's time to do a heart check. It's time to reevaluate your relationship with the big guy. Because let me tell you something. Part of being hungry and thirsting for righteousness is wanting to be like Jesus. That's a huge piece of it, wanting to be like Jesus. If you refuse to show mercy in your life, you are nothing like Jesus. Nothing like Jesus. When the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart to be merciful, listen. Listen. Sometimes mercy requires love. The kind of love that you can only get from God. You know how important mercy is? <laughs> let's let's just do a let's just do a quick picture of the importance of mercy. Do you remember a little thing called the Ark of the Covenant? What is this thing? You know, God, God had him fashioned basically a, a big, heavy, golden box in, in which the, and, and it had, had angels sitting on top of it. And inside the box, there were a couple of items. I know it had the staff of Moses, the tablets, and I think there was something else. Forgive me for my, my sometimes things just, it, 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 it's there and it's like, poof, it's gone. But the important thing about the Ark of the Covenant to realize is it was the box in which the law was kept. It was, it was, the, it was the box, the container in which the law was stored. But you want to know what was even more important in the law? You know what, what covered the law? That lid 
with the angels, the mercy seat. So God was even showing from the very, very beginning of, the, of his relationship with the, with the Jewish people, his chosen people. You know, during the time of Moses, he, had, he instructed them to create this box, to store the law, but above the law was the place of mercy. Do you think that was an accident? Let me tell you what, God doesn't do anything by accident. The mercy seat was placed above the law for a reason, because mercy triumphs over the law. And sometimes it takes love. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Be merciful, folks. Let us pray.